What did that guy tip you? I ask as the blue Aston Martin leaves the restaurant property. He gave me a dollar, Angelo says. That and a college degree will get you jack squat, I say, shaking my head. Angelo and I are standing outside the restaurant in our maroon jackets that say Paradise Valet on the backs. You know, Angelo says, running a hand over his close-cut black hair. When I took this job, I thought I was going to walk away with some fat tips every night. I mean, this is the swankiest restaurant in town, right? Turns out, rich people don't tip for Bunch of Now you tell me, I say. It's only my second day on the job. And for all of yesterday, I was hopeful that the crappy tips were just a fluke. I guess not. Both of our phones suddenly erupt with an emergency alert sound. I take my phone out and look at it. It's an amber alert. There's not a lot of information though. It says a five-year-old girl by the name of Ariel Proud was taken. And it lists where she was last seen and what she was wearing. A pink tutu skirt with a matching bow in her hair and a white t-shirt with a cartoon cat on it. Holy shit, that's like four blocks from here, Angelo says, looking at his phone. Too bad they didn't get a car make or model. Yeah, I say, putting my phone away. We're silent for a moment, and my thoughts go back to the issue of money. I need more of it. Then I remember the only good tipper from last night. What about that one guy with the long hair and the beard? I ask. Looked like he was from the Middle East? Oh yeah, I don't know that guy's name, Angelo says. But he always tips well, and go figure, he drives an old Dodge Spirit. So the crappier the car, the better the tips? Pretty much, Angelo says. The throaty hum of a powerful engine comes to my ears, and I look over to see a badass black Lamborghini Diablo pulling into the parking lot. Oh shit, Angelo says under his breath. Uh, I gotta use the bathroom. You take this one. I turn to look at my coworker, but he's already hurrying back toward the back of the restaurant to go in through the kitchen to use the bathroom. The manager says we're not allowed to go in through the front door, says we'll ruin the ambiance, asshole. The Diablo pulls up to the valet stand and the driver's side scissor door pops upward as it opens. I stare at the car, barely containing my excitement at getting to drive the thing, albeit only for a few dozen yards or so. But when the massive man steps out of the car, All my excitement is replaced by a thick sense of dread that seems to increase as he steps around the car toward me. The man is completely bald, not a hair to be seen anywhere on his face. He has no eyelashes that I can see, and no eyebrows either. His eyes are pale and dull, and he wears a blank expression on his pale slab of a face. As he steps up to the valet stand, I realize the man is nearly seven feet tall and he wears an immaculate black suit with a black shirt and tie. He's thick, but not fat, and he moves with the grace of a much smaller man. Keys are in the ignition, he says in a feathery voice that strikes me as false. You don't have a valet key? I ask after a moment, unable to meet his gaze for more than a few seconds at a time. I trust you, he says with a wink. I feel a sudden rush of hate for this complete stranger. I'm not usually one to feel hate for people I don't even know. I can't honestly say I hate anyone aside from maybe every politician ever and pharmaceutical company executives. Watching the man walk into the restaurant, I feel that hate fade to a dull simmer. Shaking my head, I move around and get in the Diablo. I don't feel any joy as I shut the door and put the thing into gear. Instead, I feel a hideous sense of disgust. It stays with me as I park the vehicle and get out. As I lock the doors, I glance in through the window at a splash of color in the back seat. There's a pink bow there, the kind a five-year-old girl would wear. In a daze, I walk back to the valet stand to find that Angelo is back. I tell myself it has to be a coincidence. Maybe the guy has a daughter and the bow belongs to her. Maybe he was watching a friend's kid and took her for a ride in the Lambo. There are a thousand reasons why a pink bow would end up in the back of his car. And the least likely of them is that he abducted the girl, right? I'm not so sure. Dude, you okay? Angelo says as I put the keys into the valet stand. Who is that guy? I ask, the one with the Lambo. Angelo shrugs, shakes his head, and pulls out his phone. He doesn't want to talk about it, but I do. 
Angelo, I saw something in his car. I saw, what did you see? The giant bald man says, suddenly standing just outside the restaurant doors. I freeze, looking at him. His face is no longer blank. His fleshy features are twisted into a maniacal grin and white flames dance in his eyes. He steps up to me, getting less than a foot away. I stare up at him, unable to speak. Get my car, Angelo, he says. I'm calling it an early night. The person I was hoping to run into isn't here. Without a word, Angelo grabs the keys and runs off to fetch the Lambo. Turning his attention back to me, he says, what did you see in the car? N nothing, just nothing. His smile gets wider. Let's you and me go for a little ride. Angelo won't mind, I know he won't. I shake my head, but no sound comes out of my mouth. Angelo comes screeching up in the Lambo, clearly in a hurry to get this guy out of here. I'm taking Lucas here with me, the guy says, pushing me toward the car with a hand on my back. Yes, sir, Angelo says, averting his eyes. The question of how he knows my name seems unimportant, given what's happening. When we get to the vehicle, I lock my legs and refuse to get in. The man doesn't react with violence, though. He puts a meaty hand under my chin and tilts my face toward his. I'm going to show you how beautiful the darkness can be, he says. We'll discuss all that is dreamt of in your pitiful philosophy, Lucas. And then we will experience the viciousness of nature together. We'll turn it into a little game. And the stakes are everything. I manage nothing more than a swallow. I can't speak. He leans in further and whispers in my ear. I'm going to rip your bones out of your body one at a time. You'll be alive for it all. But before that, I'll make you watch as I do the same to that little girl. Now get in the Lambo. Working on its own, my body betrays me and folds me into the passenger seat. I'm drenched in sweat and shivering all at once. The man gets into the driver's seat. Just as he's about to put the vehicle in gear, a man with long hair and a beard steps in front of the Diablo. It's the good tipper the Middle Eastern man who drives the Dodge Spirit. He glares through the windshield at the giant beside me. Oh, great, the man says under his breath. Fun's over. He rolls down his window. Emmanuel, I was hoping to run into you tonight. Emmanuel looks at me and says, get out. I happily oblige, standing next to Angelo, shaking with relief. Emmanuel gives us a smile and a wink as he walks around and takes my place in the Lambo. After he pulls the door closed, the Diablo speeds off into the night. As I watch it go, I know I won't be coming back to this job, not ever again. Anyone stupid enough to give me anything other than a valet key deserves what they get. If you don't know, a valet key is named as such for a very important reason. You can't open the glove compartment or the trunk with the valet key. All you can do with it is unlock the door and start the car. Modern luxury cars come with valet fobs that limit what someone like me can do with your car. Some of them limit the speed to something like 25 or 30 miles an hour by interfacing with the computer in the vehicle. Some of them will even shut the car down if it travels too far while operating on a valet key fob. Unfortunately, not all cars come with valet keys or fobs. If your car doesn't have one, it means that anything important you may have in the trunk or the glove compartment might just go missing if you give a valet worker like me your primary car key. But I never could have imagined in my wildest dreams what I'd find in this old Plymouth Barracuda's trunk. Five minutes ago now, the driver, a nervous and twitchy guy who looked like that actor Rick Moranis from the Honey I Shrunk the Kids movies, handed the keys off to me. I said please and thank you like a good valet boy, but I laughed aloud <laughs> when I got into the car and realized he'd given me the primary keys. My boss, Victor, glared at me from behind the valet stand, his beady wet eyes watching me like a dodo bird. I sneered at him and drove off to park the cherry red Barracuda. When I had it in the valet lot, I checked the glove compartment, nothing of value to take. In fact, there was nothing at all in the glove compartment, which I found strange. Then I got out and came around to the back of the car and popped the trunk. And here I stand, staring into the trunk with a stupid grin on my face, thinking of all the possibilities. I hear a car approaching from behind me and I slam the trunk, 
turning around to see Victor driving up in Mrs. Wickersham's Range Rover. What the hell are you doing, Alan? He says in his bitchy boss voice. The sound drags across my nerves like a rake across concrete. At first, I think of playing dumb, like I wasn't just looking in the trunk, which is a definite no-no. But then a little voice whispers in my ear, and a new plan jumps to mind like a hand shooting up from a fresh grave. I put on my best serious face and say, you're gonna wanna see this, boss. See what? You're not supposed to be looking in people's trunks. How many times do I have to tell you? Just cause your dad owns the valet. It's serious, I interject. Like, we need to call the cops serious. Victor studies me for a long moment, and I see the change come over his face. Let me park this thing and I'll be right there. What an idiot. I nod. While he's parking the Range Rover, I use the key to unlock the trunk, but I don't open it all the way. Not yet. Soon, Victor steps up beside me and puts his hands on his hips. Okay, let's see what's so important we need to call the police. I hesitate. I don't want to see it again, I say. You open it and look. I step away as soon as Victor takes hold of the trunk lid. He opens it and peers inside. Oh my God, he says. What the? I shoulder check him in the back, sending his upper body tumbling into the trunk. Then I grab his legs and flip them in after him, shutting the trunk as soon as he's in. Standing with my hands on the smooth metal, I breathe heavily, waiting, listening. There's a faint crunching sound followed by some gurgling, and there's nothing, just the silence of the abyss. I smile. No, I don't know what happened to him, Dad. I practice. He went to park Mrs. Wickersham's car and never came back. It's the strangest thing. Pocketing the keys, I turn to go back to the valet stand when I stop and look back at the Barracuda. The voice whispers to me again, and I nod. I head back to the valet stand to find several cars waiting for me, their owners angry. God forbid they parked their own cars, but I mollify them all with sincere apologies, and I park their cars as quick as I can. When I'm done and the Barracuda's keys are back in the stand, I call my dad and tell him Victor has been gone for nearly 20 minutes. Just like I knew he would, he comes down to see what's going on when he can't get a hold of Victor. The first car I park after my dad arrives is a Lexus. But as I'm on my way back, I pull out my phone and call my father. Dad, I say, come quick, it's Victor. He's in the trunk of this Barracuda. I tell dad to bring the keys. He arrives at a jog, joining me next to the Barracuda's trunk. He's in there, I say, all wide eyes and concern. It's technically not a lie, after all. Dad unlocks the trunk and opens the lid. Apparently, Victor was sufficient to get the thing's strength up because it grabs my dad around the head and waist with two reddish tentacles and pulls him into the massive mouth that takes up most of the trunk space. There are no eyes, and the rubbery skin seems fused to the structure of the car. I know instinctively that the creature's not in the car. It is the car. My dad doesn't have a chance to scream as he's pulled into the crunching maw, his spine snapping as he's folded like a crispy piece of pizza. I know for a fact that the valet business 10 stands across the city will be mine when all is said and done, and I know how much money it makes. Smiling, I go to shut the trunk as the creature munches on my father. But before I can shut it, one of those tentacles shoots out and wraps around my neck. Before it can tighten enough to suffocate me, I manage a few words. You got a deal, I say, just before I'm pulled inside and the pain starts. My phone pings from the coffee table while gunshots and grenade blasts come from the television. It only takes me a second to glance at the phone, like I'm a freaking Pavlov's dog. But that second is all it takes to get a bullet to the head. Cursing under my breath, I lean forward and grab my phone while I respawn in the video game. Some lady was asking about you a little while ago, the text says. She seemed pretty pissed. It's from one of my coworkers at the valet stand outside the casino. His name is Marcus and he doesn't know I steal little trinkets from cars on occasion. They're just little things that will fit in my pocket. Things that can be replaced for under five bucks, like a kid's toy or chapstick or a tire pressure gauge. But I've only stolen one thing in the last week and it was from some blonde lady's SUV. I don't know why I do it. It's probably some kind of way to exercise what little bit of power I have over the people with their fancy cars and fat bank accounts and shitty tips. 
If I could afford a therapist, I'd probably find out that this compulsion is the tip of the iceberg for some deep-seated issues about self-confidence or some shit. I exit the game and text Marcus back. What was she saying? When was this? He texts me back right away. I don't know. She asked me to get the manager, so I did. She talked to Jose and then left about 15 minutes ago. The item I took from the woman's car is a fancy looking pen, black and silver. Probably a little more expensive than the things I usually take, but not by much, maybe 10 bucks or so. Still, I could get in trouble for taking it. I get up from the couch, pocket my phone, and go to the kitchen in my small apartment. I open a drawer where I put all the little trinkets I've stolen. There's the pen, right where I left it. I should probably throw it away. I should probably throw them all away. Picking the pen up, I look it over to make sure I didn't accidentally steal some famous pen that's worth a thousand dollars or something. I don't think so. It's fancier than your average pen, but it's not that fancy, even if it is a little thicker than the average pen. As I stand, thinking, I mess with the pen. I twist the cap and see the tip come out. Then I step over to the trash can, open the lid with my foot, and toss the pen inside. It breaks in half. What the hell? I mutter, bending down to take a closer look. It's not like I threw it hard or anything. Then I see the issue. It's not just a pen. There's a USB drive hidden in it. It came apart in the middle, revealing the silver USB connector. Reaching in among the coffee grounds and takeout boxes, I grab the side of the pen with the USB connector and take it to my bedroom, firing up my laptop. I open the drive and see that it's full of pictures. I click on one and recoil from the screen. What the fuck? Before I can fully process what I've just seen, there's a banging knock at my apartment door. I jump from my seat, dread poisoning my insides. Unsure what to do, I stand there, frozen, until another bang comes from the door. Whoever is out there is trying to break my door down. I reach down and grab the USB drive, shoving it in my pocket. I quickly pull on my shoes and grab my keys as the banging increases. I can hear the wood of my door frame splintering. Luckily, I'm on the first floor. I sneak out my bedroom window and run out to the parking lot, jumping into my car. As I'm backing out of the spot, gunfire erupts from ahead of me, near my building. Bullets punch into the windshield, narrowly missing me as I shout and hit the gas, tearing out of the parking lot. I glance into the rearview mirror, seeing the blonde woman running with a pistol in her hand toward the parking lot. I mutter, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, as I drive as fast as I can toward the nearest police station. My phone rings in my pocket, but I don't dare answer it. About a half mile from the police station, headlights swerve in traffic behind me. It's the woman, and she's gaining on me. I put the pedal to the floor, nearly crashing twice before I get to the police station. Coming to a skidding halt in a handicapped spot in front of the station, I jump out of my car and run inside. Help! I shout. I need help! Someone's trying to kill me! The cop at the desk calmly escorts me back into the station as I blabber about the hidden flash drive and the pictures on it. She has pictures of a guy locked up in a cage with his legs cut off. I didn't even look at the other ones. I couldn't look at them. Okay the cop says, sitting me in a small, windowless room. Okay, just calm down. You're safe now. We'll have someone come in and get this sorted out. Okay, I say, calming just a little. Thank you. Just hang tight, the cop says. Someone will be right in. He leaves and shuts the door behind him. Several minutes pass, and I calm down even more. What's stealing a pen compared to torturing some guy in a dungeon? Nothing, that's what. I suddenly remember that my phone was ringing and I pull it out to check who was calling and texting me. It was Marcus. He tried calling me first, but then he sent a couple of messages. I look at the first one. Jose gave the lady your address, it says. Heads up. I had already figured that much. It's the second message that sends that black dread coursing through my veins. Dude, it says, she's a cop. What the hell did you do? There's a soft knock at the door, and then it opens. The blonde lady looks in at me. She's wearing a badge at her waist and a gun on her hip. The cop from the front desk stands beside her. That's him, she says to the uniformed officer. That's the suspect. I'm glad he came to his senses. I'll be taking him over to my precinct now. 
Thank you, officer. No! I scream. No! That's her! That's her! She's the one! I know I'll never make it to another precinct. Not alive, anyway. I scream and scream while she cuffs me. But my screams fall on deaf ears. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.